Hello, and welcome to Victory Chat with Jackie McKeever. I'm Jackie McKeever, your host. And on Victory Chat, we talk about faith, finances, books, and business. Why? Because your victory starts here. Your victory literally starts with a conversation. And speaking of books, I'm doing a special series called Behind the Author's Pen, where we put some of your familiar or maybe not so familiar authors in the hot seat and ask them 10 questions. So today we have Xane Anderson. He wrote the book called What I Want My Children to Know Before I Die. Welcome, X. How are you doing? Thanks, Jackie. I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on the show today. Really appreciate it. Are you ready to get in our hot seat and let us get all behind your, your pen and in your business? <laughs> <laughs> we'll see if I'm ready or not. Okay. We'll okay. So our first question is, why did you decide to write this book? Well, you know, I got to tell you, as, as an eight-year-old boy, I watched my mom die. Mm. And um, I know that there were little things that she did uh, when I was six, when I was seven, just little things she said, even just little comments, things that took five seconds that are still profoundly, profoundly affecting me today. And, you know, from this experience, it was one of the hardest things that I ever went through. But from this experience, I learned that the effect that you have as a parent, in my view, is going to go on so much further than anything that happens in the business world. You know, I think, you know, for example, and nothing against doing work that's good and working in the business world. Great for anybody who's, who's building a business. That's, that's amazing. But the, the thing is, is the influence we have in parents. I know that little tiny things that she did are affecting me today. And they're affecting my, my kids, which are her grandchildren that she never met. I just think it's important for us as parents to think about what kind of legacy are we leaving? What, what kind of things are we teaching our children? And it's probably one of the most important things we can ask ourselves. That's really good. So how long did it take for you to write this book? Oh, great question. Well, you know, I, I really think that if people will just lock themselves in a room for a few weeks, they could probably write a book. For me, it took me a few years. Um, Not lock off and yourself on here in a room. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, lock yourself in a room with nobody to bug you. You could probably you could probably write a book in a few weeks, but it took me a few years. And you know, you kind of go in spurts where you have some time and then you let things ponder and then you have some more time. So it was a little bit of a process over over a few years. Um. So were there any delays in publishing the book once it was written? Well, what was interesting is I decided to publish it on May 5th, which is um, actually, I, I published on May 5th of this year intentionally. I, I could have published it just a little bit earlier, but I decided to wait till then. And because May 5th was actually the last day that I ever gave my mom a hug before she oh, died. So it was published. So sweet. It was kind of symbolic. It was 36 years to the day later that she died, but I thought I'm going to publish it on the, the, the last day that, that I ever gave her a hug. And um, so, yeah, it was a little delayed, but it was intentionally. And actually I should have written the book about three years ago and just got mm -hmm. it done. So it was delayed in more than one way. Yes. <laughs> um, who is this book written for? Well, you know, I wrote it for my children, but there's also, you know, if I, if you want to share this much stuff with your children, in other words, let's mm -hmm. say you have a hundred things to share with your children. Maybe there's, I don't know, 50, 60, 70 things you'd want to share with your children, but you could also share with the public. And so the book doesn't represent everything I'd want to share with my children, but it represents the part that I'd want to share with my children that I also thought that perhaps the public could benefit from. And so, um, a good deal of what I'd want to share with my children is in this book. I think that's wonderful because you sharing it with them, they can actually share it with your uh, future grandchildren and stuff. And it'll get, con it'll continue because a book is permanent. It, I mean, you know, it just, as long as that Amazon or whoever you're printing is, is exists, the book can continue to be reprinted even long after you. So that's a wonderful idea. Um, have you ever written any books or stories or articles or blogs before? Yeah, I did. Actually, you know, I started out, my first book was a book about, um, it was a book about sales. 
And uh, it was a business related book. And it was lucky that it got on Forbes, uh, which was very helpful. Oh, cool. But, but you know, it's interesting. A lot of the same principles that you use, you know, when you're trying to influence people in a business situation, trying to help a, a business still move forward, there are a lot of the same principles you can use with your own children, you know, um, yeah. when you're trying to say, you know, I've got a child. One of, let me just give you one example. Um, they say that the most effective way to shape human behavior in any situation, whether you're trying to, you know, help your child or a business situation is to just catch people doing something right. And so a lot of the times in our, when we're parenting, you know, you've, you've seen the parent where the kid walks in and the, the, the parent says something like this. They say, I can't believe you stayed up till three in the morning last night and you didn't make your bed and you, and you, um, you're watching too much TV, you're playing too much video games, and you got a C minus on your test or whatever it was. The thing that we have to remember is that behaviors are like seeds and attention is like water. So if you can imagine, I have a pitcher of water in my mm. hand. I water the behaviors I want to see grow with attention. But the problem that a lot of parents do and people in business too, is they'll see something they don't like, and then they'll give it a lot of attention. And what they don't realize that they're doing is they're actually making it more likely that that behavior will occur. Mm. And so one of the best things, you know, I, I'm not very good at this. I'll admit this. Okay. But I'll tell you, I'm, there's a couple of times I've good. got it Keep right. Going. <laughs> my, if you can catch your kids doing something right, let me give you one example. My daughter, she's awesome. She's just a good girl. But I'm saying one morning she got up and she said, Hey dad, I made my bed. I made my lunch. I got ready for school surprise. And I had just not too long ago learned about this positive reinforcement thing, which is where you catch people doing something right. And I went to my wife in the closet and I said, you know what? Let's give this a lot of attention. Let's see if it really works. And so I, I went out there and I said, gosh, wow, your bed looks great. You made your lunch. You got dressed thank you. And I just gave it a lot of attention. And my wife did the same. She, she gave a lot of attention. Well, it was really interesting because the behavior repeated itself. She did it again and she did it again. And we kept watering it, you know, um, with attention. Right. And that is so much more effective. Like they've actually found, like, this isn't just me talking. This is like scientific studies that have shown that if you want to influence your child, really be keyed in to what they do right. Um, one more quick story. I got to tell you really quick. Go ahead. I love Wes, stories. <laughs> Wes, okay, I'm gonna, I got one and a half stories. I'll just finish okay. this story. I got to tell you one more because it came to mind. Then I'll, we'll move on. But they, um, it would have been less effective if I would have just stormed in her room and said, you know, waited till she slept in and didn't make her bed and didn't make her lunch and said, how many times do I have to tell you to get up and make your lunch? That would have been actually reinforcing the behavior of her sleeping in and not making her lunch. One more quick, real quick story. There was this kid who was getting sent to the principal's office. And it's actually in this book called The Power of Positive Parenting, which is a great book. I didn't write it. It's by Glenn Latham. And he tells this story about where this kid uh, was getting sent to the principal's office all the time. And it became such a problem that they they asked the school counselor to come in and look um, and see what was going on. And so the school counselor came in and, and sat in the back of this classroom and, and just observed and she observed that this, this particular boy was doing a lot of things right, a like quite a few things right, but nobody was giving the boy any attention, zero attention for the things he was doing that were good and right. But as soon as the kid would do something wrong, the teacher would do something like this. They'd say, oh, there you go again, and write the name on the board. Then the kid would do something wrong again. He'd get a check mark, and then another thing, and another check mark. And soon he's getting marched out down to the principal's office. What was interesting, she went, to, she followed the kid to the principal's office and, the, and the, the receptionist, I don't remember exactly how it goes, but maybe said, well, I knew you'd be here again and puts him in this chair next to a window. And this window, it was right during lunch. And what happened is, is as the kids would come by, they'd be waving to each other. So he's getting a lot of attention from his friends for being here in the principal's office, mm. right? Because they're waving to him through the window. And it was basically something like this, you know, basically the, the behavior was really predictable because all the good behavior was being starved of attention and the bad behavior was going to be given a lot of attention by, by the teacher and the kids who were waving at him and all. And so 
the interesting thing is with our spouses in our marriages or relationships with our um, children, with our business associates, there really is a lot of right going on if we'll just key into it, right? So if we can say, I've got to be the kind of person who's going to start catching my kids doing something right rather than always catching them doing something wrong, which again, I'm not great at, but I'm trying, okay? If we want to shape and influence them for good, I think that's one of the most powerful things. And that's part of, you know, uh, that concept is in the book. Just a lot of other things that I want my children to know. That's so. real good. Um, another old saying, I don't know if you heard this one before. It's uh, you can catch more flies with honey than vinegar, oh, yeah. which means the same thing of what you said, but yours, <laughs> what you said was more interesting. <laughs> anyway, because <laughs> well, no, right. anyway, exactly right. nobody wanted me to think about flies and things of that nature, but that's, <laughs> that was an old saying. And that that's, that's really true um, because when we, um, because on a subconscious level, when we don't um, reaffirm the positive things that, or the good things that children or people or whoever are working with us, then they do repeat the bad things because the, um, in their head, they think, okay, this is how I get the attention. This is how um, I don't feel love unless I'm showing out, you know, or, that's right. you know, and so that's, that's good. That's really good. No, I really like what you said too, Jackie, with about, um, you know, that honey does work better than vinegar. Honey works better than vinegar, you know, if you catch people doing something right, rather than being the, and it can even work with the spouse or, you know, if, you know, if your, if your spouse leaves the socks out, it really annoys you. Just don't say anything about it. Starve that behavior of attention. But then see if you can key into something they're doing right. But that's hard. And watch. It is hard. That's it is hard. hard work. I'm not going to lie. It's because hard work. as a woman, you have to pick. Listen, as I have to speak for the women around there picking up men's <laughs> socks, I, that is frustrating. You like, you reward them. And then that sock is just sitting there. And then you have to pick it, stop what you're doing and pick it up or <laughs> consciously. I hear I you. know he's going to leave them socks. Let me stop what I'm doing. I can't <laughs> go to bed because it's going to put his socks on the floor. <laughs> or, so it's really funny. It's funny when you think about it, when you're talking about it, it can be frustrating. But yeah, oh, yeah. you got to be like, okay, let me get over this sock and just throw the dang sock in the hamper and be done with it. You know? Well, and the other thing is, too, uh, they've actually found if you start keying into the good behavior, and by the way, I'm glad you're defending the women out there. <laughs> Thank you. <Jackie. laughs> oh, <what's> uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, what I was saying is, is they found that if you start catching them doing stuff right, like sometimes that bad behavior starts to dissolve because they know they're supposed to put the sock away. They're just, you know, they get, it's almost like if you get attention for it, even if it's kind of this unhealthy attention, it's still attention, right? And they say people would rather have some attention than no attention. It's just where are we, what kind of attention are we giving them, you know? So, um, but yeah, I, uh, I'll, 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 I'll speak in defense of the women too. Let's, for all of, all of you dads or husbands, men out there, man, see if you can catch your wife doing stuff right too, you know, to catch her key into what she's doing right. She's probably doing a ton of things right give more attention to your wife or your, 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 in your relationships as a, as a parent. Say, thank you for picking up my socks. I That's right. Thank keep, you. I keep leaving that sock on the floor. Yeah. I then apologize for leaving your socks on the floor. I'll go for there. There you go. <laughs> okay. Uh, will there be any other books for you? Oh goodness. You know, it's such a project. There's a good chance there will be. I need a, I need about a year to, <laughs> to think what think lot. that one over. <laughs> yeah. Oh, um, what do you want readers to get when they read this book? I would just hope that readers really start to think about what kind of legacy they're leaving their kids. And there's this, you know it doesn't have to be some huge big thing. And I'm not talking about money or financial legacy. I'm talking about the emotional, the spiritual, the, the things you teach your children, that kind of a legacy. Um, and I really believe that the little tiny things, cause I, you know, I can tell you just little things my mom did. Let, let me tell you one example. When I was young, 
Jackie, I used to like to draw trees and I'd draw them with all these leaves, you know, all the little veins in the leaves, every single branch. I'd spend a lot of time. You can imagine a tree with dozens of leaves. Well, I went to, I went to school and I saw how the other children drew trees and they drew them with like two little lines and a little poofy cloud on top like this. Well, I saw how the other children drew trees and I stopped drawing them the way I used to. And I started drawing them the way the other children did. And I found out later when my mom saw this, that she actually cried. I mean, mm. you can imagine why. Um, fast forward several years, I'm at a, I'm at a little league game. Um, and by the way, I was really bad at little league. I mean, some people are really good and can hit the ball. I, I just would hit, hold the bat out like this and the ball would hit the bat and fall. It's called a bunt. I had one bunt the entire season. Um, but I'm not here to tell you how bad I was at playing uh, little league. When I was done with that, I, um, we went home. My mom, my mom started having a headache and my dad became concerned. And, uh, he said, you know, I'm going to take mom to the hospital. And, uh, I remember being a little concerned. I gave my mom a hug. I told her I loved her. And my, there wasn't, we had, a, my, my uncle was visiting at the time and aunt and I went to my uncle and I said, is my mom going to die? Hmm. And he said, no, she's not going to die. She probably just has a migraine. And I said, do you promise she's not going to die? And he said, I promise she's not going to die. She, she's probably just has a migraine. And I wanted to believe him. I went downstairs, I climbed up on my bunk bed and I read, started reading this book about squirrels. I still remember the book. And I waited and waited for my parents to get home. They didn't get home. Hmm. And uh, next morning I woke up and I was a little bit anxious wanting to see my parents. I, I opened the, the door to my room and there was kind of this family room, kind of long family room outside my door. And I, I looked down on the other side of this family room and I could see my dad there, but something was different. My mom was not there. Hmm. Instead, there was a friend and another friend and a neighbor and another neighbor and another neighbor. It seemed like half the neighborhood was in our home. And as I walked closer, I could see uh, that my dad had been crying. And as I got even closer, kind of gathered uh, my brothers and sisters together, the children together. And he said words I'll never forget. He said, I think our mom is going to leave us. And uh, I kind of put two and two together. I went into a panic and I said, dad, dad, we got to do something. What can we do? Anyway, my mom had suffered a cerebral hemorrhage. She was on life support at the hospital. She was brain dead. Oh, sorry. Um, I remember two days later, they walked into the hospital room. I could see my mom. She had tubes coming out of her nose. And, uh, it came a time where they needed to take her off of life support. And so um, they did. When they did, I remember she kind of crinkled up and turned bluish. Mm. And I was wanted to, wanted to give her a kiss. I was afraid to because she didn't look like my mom. So I went and kind of faked one, kissed a couple inches from her head, and, and I walked out. Well, my mom died that day. And as an eight-year-old boy, I watched her die. I did, I'll tell you really quick. I re remember when I, my, one of the doctors there said that after my mom, after I'd left the room, my mom kind of on her own went from being crinkled up to kind of where she spread her, her arms almost like she was coming into a beautiful place. But here's my question for you. How do you think I draw trees now. How do you draw trees now? Well, I draw them the way my mom would want me to. The way with all the leaves, the, the way that she, you know, the way I see them, the way she'd want me to. In fact, every time I tell this story, and I'm telling this story right now, figuratively, even right now with you, Jackie, on this call, figuratively, I'm drawing trees the way I see them right now, by sharing my heart with you. That's beautiful. And the little things we do as parents, little things we say, you know, catching our kids doing something right instead of catching them doing something wrong, just little things like that. 
can be passed down for centuries. And that's what I want people to get out of this book is that they don't need to do something huge. They don't have to go out and write a book. They don't need to go, you know, change everything. Maybe it's just today. I'm going to catch my kid doing five things, right? I'm just going to key in. And I'm going to say, Hey, really like the way you did that. I really like the way you did that. Or thanks for making your bed or whatever it is. Just little things like that. they start to build confidence. They'll know that mom or dad loves them. They know that they're, they're doing something right. What are the little things that you and I and the listeners here can do as parents? Just little things consistently, you know, each day that are going to make a big difference. That's what I hope people get out of this book. That is awesome. Um, what my next question is, what authors inspire you? Oh, gosh, there's a number of them. I, I really like uh, Stephen Covey. Mm -hmm. I think he's got some great stuff. I actually like this book I shared with you. It's Power of Positive Parenting. If you want to learn that, catch your kid doing something right. This is a deep dive into that. Um, C.S. Lewis, uh, he's a Christian writer. He has he can really explain things in a way that's that I, I really enjoy. So those are the ones that inspire me. Among with many others, but those three are probably ones that are has come to mind right away. Ooh, um, my next question is: What advice would you give others writing a book? Just start. You know, some people say they want to write a book, and they're like, "Well, I got to do it at the right time or whatever." You know, I. Part of the process of writing a book, I would say, was just just start brain dumping. Just start writing down everything you can think of and try to organize it later. But just, you know, you've got, if you feel like you need to write a book, there's something inside of you that needs to, to, to share with the world and do good and just start, just start. And don't, don't worry about the organization. You can worry about that later. <laughs> That'd be my advice. Awesome. And don't worry about having to do it all at once. You know, if you get out, if you go in your room for 20 minutes and you write a few paragraphs, that's <laughs> you said, great. I thought we were locking ourselves in the room. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you want to get it done fast, <laughs> Jack, you're going to call me out on all kinds of good stuff here, aren't you? Lock yourself in a room for three weeks and don't talk to anybody if you want to do it fast. <laughs> and don't put your socks on the floor, okay? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I'm joking. That's right. That's right. Okay. Well, um. Can, um, if you don't mind, would you give us a sample reading from your book or, and, and don't forget to tell us where we can purchase your book. Sure. So this is my book and it's called what I want my children to know before I die. I've got this funny name. If you can remember how to spell it, it's E K S A Y N. I see it and has a tree on it. It's got a tree. You can see there's a reason why there's a tree on there. <laughs> um, I guess I'll read just a little bit of the back. Um, it says May 5th. 1986 was the last time I looked into my mother's deep brown eyes and embraced her before she left for the hospital and didn't return. I haven't given my mother a hug since that day, but there is something that is almost as good. It is feeling her influence. And I feel it right now as I'm typing this. I don't know when I will die, but I hope this book may in some way act as an embrace from me to you talking to my children, I guess to anybody who's reading it. This book is published on May 5th, 2022, exactly 36 years later. And even though I haven't given my mom a hug in 36 years, there have been a few times when I least expect it, but need it most, that I can still feel her embrace. Oh, that is so beautiful. I love your writing. I hope to hear more about books like that. That is so deep. Thanks, Jackie. Oh, okay. Um, where can they purchase? Where can they oh. purchase your book from? So, if they can remember how to spell my funny name, it's E K S. E K S is in Sam. A Y N is in Nancy. It's six letters long. E K S A Y N. If you go on Amazon and just put that name in, or look up what I want my children to know before I die, or they can go to xane.com, which is E K S A Y N.com. It will get you to a place where you can buy my book. No worries. I will put it down in the description. Um, you can watch this recording on my YouTube channel at Jackie D as in Delta McKeever on YouTube. 
And while you're there, don't forget to subscribe. I want to thank you so much, Exane, for coming on our show and sharing so many beautiful stories and for writing this book. Y'all, make sure y'all go ahead and, and purchase you a copy. Make sure you connect. Um, make sure you subscribe and upload this broadcast. Thank you so much for coming on Victory Chat with Jackie. Remember, your victory starts here. Thank you again. Thank you, Jackie. It's been an honor to be on your show. Thank you so much. Bye now.